Welcome back to the Texas Legacy Support Network show. I'm your host, Chris Daly, and this is season three of the show. This year, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Instead of a single title sponsor for the entire season, we wanted to break it up and give people opportunities to sponsor individual episodes. That lowers the barrier of entry and allows people to get involved and support this amazing series in a budget that fits them. If you want to help share the stories of the people who made UT Athletics possible, in their own words, reach out to Billy Dale at TLSN.org or myself, Chris Daly, 713-269-4620, and we will find a way to get you and your company involved in supporting this important program. episode of the Texas Legacy Support Network show is brought to you by Beth Koblenz Realtor. You can find her at 281-772-8936. Today I have the honor of introducing to you a Texas high school football standout from San Antonio Churchill, a University of Texas Hall of Honor member, a captain of one of the most outstanding collection of defensive backs in the history of the Longhorns, the original DBU. I am talking about Glenn Blackwood. All right, everybody join me in welcoming Glenn Blackwood to the show. Glenn, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I'm I'm joined here with Larry Carlson, and and we're going to kind of talk about um, your whole life. I want I want to start with when where you grew up. You grew up in San Antonio, but when did you first get into sports? Oh my gosh, uh, when did I not get into sports? Uh, my daddy played at Baylor. My I had two older brothers that we all played football and baseball and basketball and. Uh, ran track and did all that stuff. So I, I can't remember a time that I wasn't playing football out in the yard or baseball or something. Uh, and I was the youngest of four, so I was getting beat up all the time. So uh, uh, I, I, I think maybe that helped me to persevere through some of this stuff. But it, it just it was a part of our family. And, and I tell you who was the toughest of all uh, after mm-hmm. a game was my mom. I mean, she yeah. didn't cut us any slack at all. And <laughs> she was like, you know, suck it up, boys. <laughs> That's great. I love it. I love it. And so you played high school football at Churchill. Uh, and and it was while you were there, they had, I think, one of their years was 12-1. and one, And uh, it was at the time the, their best record in the history of the school, right? Yeah, we went undefeated my senior year and then went on to quarterfinals and uh, lost in the uh, – played in the Astrodome against Baytown Sterling, I think it was, and uh, and ended up losing that game. So that was that team. Yeah, you guys, uh, you know, were led by Ted Constanzo, all-state quarterback, and, of course, then you uh, – you and, and Ted signed at the same time to uh, play up at the 40 Acres, so – we 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 did sign at the same time, but it was a little bit different uh, circumstances as to how we signed. Ted, <laughs> Ted was re, Ted was recruited by everybody. He was he was you know as he was the quarterback, I think literally in the country that everybody wanted to take and stand to him. Phenomenal player, great guy, still a dear friend of mine to this day, and. Uh, uh, and I had one scholarship offer. To, no, I had two. I had I had one and a half. I had a, a scholarship <laughs> offer to Blend Junior College, and I think Howard Payne Bumblebees offered me half a scholarship or something like that. <laughs> I mean, it was I wasn't I was I was no blue chip. I, I don't even think I had a moon. I didn't have any stars for sure. <laughs> so, so how did you get to to UT? 
You know, uh, I, I I was a squirt. I mean, I only weighed about 150 in high school, and I was late maturing. And so, uh, you know, I, I ended up gaining about 20 pounds in between my, my senior in high school and, and uh, going, you know, getting to my first year at Texas. And uh, it was just uh, – it, it, but uh, I think – if it, it, the funny story is that I was I was sitting there in in my English class and I got a call that said go to the coach's office you know over that intercom I used to have that intercom up in the mm-hmm. room and uh, I'm thinking oh, what I what I do now you know I'm I'm thinking I'm in trouble and uh, I go in and Coach uh, Cumlander says uh, Glenn you, I got a phone call from Mike Campbell he says. Uh, to give him a call. And what had happened was Lyle, they had passed on Lyle out of Blinn, and Lyle went on to TCU and became all Southwest Conference, got drafted by the, in the NFL and played, you know, 14 years in the NFL. And so he's playing pro ball at the time, and he calls Mike Campbell up, and they were friends of ours. We had known them when we lived in Austin for about three years. And he called up Mike Campbell, and he said, Coach, you ought not pass on Glenn. He's going to be a better football player than I was. Of course, Mike Campbell, in his dry sense of humor, said he said he said, "Well, I didn't ever think Lyle was that good anyway." But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, um, Coach, he you know Lyle, Lyle called him up and he looked at Coach Royal. This is their story. He looked at Coach Royal and said, "What do you think?" And Coach Royal says, "It's your decision." So I get a phone call. Now we jump back. I'm back at school. I get this phone call, and they said, "Call uh, you, Coach Cumlander said you need to call Mike Campbell. Collect." That's how far long ago that was. You had, you had to call collect, and uh, I called him, and he said, "Glenn, you still want to come up here to the University of Texas and play football?" And I said, "Yes, sir. I'd love to." And he said, "We'll send a scholarship up in the mail." So that was my. That was my big signing day, uh, and it was after everybody else had signed, and I think they just had a scholarship left over. Somebody had, you know, uh, bailed on them or something, and and they 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 just took a gamble. And uh, I remember uh, I was talking with Coach Royal, and and I think Coach Campbell had passed at this time, and I I said, uh, you know, Coach, I said, thank you for taking a chance on me because it made a difference in my life. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, he said, well, you know, he goes, Glenn, when you turn out, you know, to be more than we thought you were going to be, it, it, it made us look like really smart people. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I really always appreciated that about, about they were, you know, coach Royal and coach Campbell were very, uh, simple in the words they said, but they had a lot of weight behind them. Mm-hmm. You know, Glenn, speaking of that, uh, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you was you played two years for Coach Royal and Coach Campbell, and then two years for Fred Akers and I guess Leon Fuller, and it's like, what, uh, you know, the old high school questions on tests, compare and contrast, um, what were the, the key differences or similarities between, you know, those coaching staffs? Wow. Uh, well, Coach Akers and Coach Royal were diametrically different. I mean, they were, you know, Daryl liked to have Willie come in and, you know, play for us uh, on evenings. And Coach Ro- Coach Akers was real. I mean, he was dressed well, wore a tie. You know, Coach Royal would be wearing a ball cap. They were both significantly different, but what they there was this common thread with every great coach that I had. I had the opportunity to play with Coach Shula down here in Miami and Bill Arnsberger, our defense coordinator, who was fantastic. And what what the common thread was was they were they all were extremely well prepared in what they. So when you came into a football game, you usually knew everything you needed to know to be able to be successful against that team. Whether you executed or not was a different story. And, uh, but I will say this, uh, it was as much as I love coach Royal and I loved him to death and I love coach Campbell to death. It was, a it was, a a really good thing for me when they changed over, uh, because 
it wasn't necessarily Coach Akers and Coach Fuller, although Coach Fuller was a great defensive coordinator. But Alan Lowry, our defensive back coach, made me a better football player. And he uh, he is he he taught me things about not wasting steps, about ways to get to the ball quicker that I used till the day I left playing in the NFL. And uh, I just uh, I can't say enough about the impact that Alan Lowry had on my career and my ability to uh, to make it in the NFL. Glenn, um, I got to mention one thing from your freshman year because I can still remember. I only saw it on TV. That was before I started working up there covering you guys uh, every day when when you were a junior. But you put one of the all-time Longhorn sticks that I've ever seen, and uh, I think you knocked out Bubba Bean and got yourself knocked out too about the two-yard line and uh, kept him out of the end zone. And you must have, as you said, probably weighed 165, 70, maybe. What do you remember about that hit? Because it was (laughs) – I just wish it was on YouTube, and I I haven't seen it. i tell you what, I actually have a copy of it on my phone. I'll send it to you. But uh, – Yeah. I found a guy, it was a quirky deal, and I don't know how it happened, but I found a guy, and he sent me a tape of the game. And I, I can't find the tape of the game, but that, that clip my secretary had had, uh, had uh, saved onto my computer. So I'll send a copy of it to you. But anyway, the funny thing about that is I did – look, I'm playing behind Raymond Claiborne at that point. You know, one of the great corners ever in at Texas and in the NFL. He was a super football player, and uh, they Bubba Bean actually had, they had fumbled, and we they recovered their own fumble, which would have been a big play for us. And it was it was seventeen ten ten at that point, and uh, and the next play, Bubba Bean busts a run down to the one yard line, and Claiborne caught him, and they they had that big old fullback George Woodard. And uh, they ran him twice. Yeah, they ran him twice uh, on the wishbone up the middle, and uh, our defensive uh, goal line just stuffed him. And so the next play is third and one, and Mike Campbell, I hear my na- I'm down with Joe Bob Bazell on the other end of the sideline yelling my name into the dip. Remember they had those dishes? they get the sound <laughs> from the game. <laughs> and Joe Bob and I think Joe Bob and I are yelling our name in the dishes. Way to go, Blackwood! Way to go, Brazil! That way, that was the only way we were going to get our name on TV. And uh, <laughs> and so uh, I swear we were. And I hear my name, Blackwood, and I said, "That's Mike Campbell." And I look and I run down there, and he goes, "Go in for Claiborne. They're not going to throw the football." And they had that little wide receiver, Carl Roaches, who was like mega fast but i could cover him for seven yards because that's all he had before he went out of the end zone and but here coach campbell was saying don't even cover him just play the run and so uh i ran in and and you should have seen the looks on the face faces of all the first claiborne he said i said claiborne he goes what i said you're out he said are you serious (laughs) and uh and uh, anyway, everybody looked at me like I had two heads, and I said, "Call the defense." And so I lined up on Roaches, and they 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 start running the play, and they ran. They actually Woodard went the wrong way, and and uh, the di- quarterback faked to nobody, and then he pitched to uh, Bubba Bean, who was about 220 pounds, and I did. I weighed about 160 at that point, and. Uh, I lined up on roaches in this. I just cut, looked in at the ball. As soon as they snapped, I just beelined it for the, you know, the backfield. And uh, he got the ball, and I hit him, and he knocked me out. And he went out for a while too. But it was a, uh, I was a hurting pup after that. But it was, it was a great experience to, you know, be up there in College Station, you know, step up and and have a coach who had who had confidence. I don't know why he called my name. I don't know why he called Black. We had a lot of pretty good players, but I think he knew I knew how to follow orders and I would do what he said to do. And uh, and uh, so, man, I I tell you, to this day, I can still feel that in my back. 
<laughs> it was, like I said, one of the all-time hits ever seen. I'm going to have to follow up and, and get a copy of that. Glenn, I, I got to ask you, you mentioned Raymond, and uh, you played with just, I mean, probably the all-time backfield, defensive backfield, uh, you, Ricky Churchman, and Derek Hatchett, and Johnny Johnson. I mean, how did the, the stars align for you guys to have everybody, you know, going to the pros back then? I mean, y'all had, I guess, like I said, here it is, 45 years later or whatever, the all-time defensive backfield. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and interestingly enough, we also had Vance Bedford, who played in the NFL, who was sure. our backup. And uh, and so, uh, uh, and Vance was a super, super corner. And uh, so what they would do back then is they would, if, if I, I could, I I just had, I think one of the things that, that gave coaches comfort with me, even though I wasn't big or fast or, you know, very impressive was, uh, that I knew what to do and I knew, I knew the game. And so if Churchman went down, they put me at strong safety and put Vance in at corner. If, if Johnny Johnson went down, they put me at free safety and put Vance at corner. They, if, you know, I mean, I was, it, it, we had this interchangeable secondary and, uh, those were fine, fine football players. Uh, it was a, such a privilege to play with them. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that, um, that we also had a dynamite defensive line that uh put a lot of pressure on guys. Uh we had a, we had such a good defense, but I mean Brad Shear and Acker and uh Steve McMichael and you know they were just animals up there and uh uh we had a it made it our life a little easier, but those guys, you know, Churchman played in the NFL with the 49ers and Johnny Johnson had a long career with the Rams and and uh, Hatchet was a first round pick with the Colts, and you know I kind of came in late. I was an eight round pick with the Dolphins, but uh, you know had an okay career in the NFL, and so you know it was uh, it just was a privilege to play with guys of that quality. And man, it was it was fun too. Looking at your career at UT in a, as a whole. What what games stand out to you as as the biggest ones, the ones that uh, you still get excited to think about and, and share? Well, uh, you know, I think I think that junior year run was uh, uh, in 1977 was pretty special. Uh, you know, Earl was lighting it up. Uh, we were we were playing such good defense. Uh, it just uh, it was hard for teams to move the ball on us. I mean, we. We went up and played Oklahoma and beat them thirteen to six. They couldn't score on us, and uh, and then we go the next week to a unbelievably good Arkansas football team. Had Ben Cowens and Jerry Eckwood, and uh, uh, they had a wide receiver that played with San Diego, and uh, I mean they had they had their offensive line. Three of them were in the NFL. They had a good deep. They had a unbelievable team we beat them 13-9 they could only get three field goals we just had a really good defense and uh it was just fun it was you know when you when you go out and you know you've got a team you're prepared well mentally you're prepared well physically and you also have the guys who can light it up and uh you know i i think when i look back on it that obviously when we came out of game four and we're, we beat Rice 72-15 and we go to number two in the country or number three and then we play OU and, uh, beating them in that game was a, a great memory for me. I'll just, uh, I just always remember the, the fun that that was. And then, then going back and having this brutal battle with Arkansas and beating them 13-9. Uh, but I will have to say the best was going into college states and beating the Aggies 52 to 28. Uh, I think it's 52, 28, maybe 57, 28. I'm giving them a little grace there, but, uh, it was, you know, I mean, when you walk into that stadium and can, you know, make that crowd go quiet, it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. You know, Glenn, uh, I, I got to spend uh, some time with Lance Taylor up in um, 
Tulsa this uh, summer with the Texas X's, and, and he and I were talking about that, and I just said, yeah, I think that's the two two greatest defensive efforts back-to-back maybe ever. You know, at least they just strike me that way, that mm-hmm. Oklahoma game and then going up to Fayetteville the next week. I've got a question for you, one more at least on the UT front, a little on the dark side, but I recall being on the sidelines uh, your junior year when you all played Houston, which was a pretty big grudge match. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, you know, you got a pretty good concussion and uh, were, you know, kind of wandering around. And back then, guys were kidding around a little bit, like saying, wow, Blackwood doesn't know where he is. You know, he's, he's goofy after that shot and stuff. How many concussions, you know, uh, when you look back, uh, are you aware of having had from high school, college, pro? And it's just such a big topic these days because CTEs become, you know, such a tragedy for mm-hmm. generations of players. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many I had, to be honest with you. I had, I had, I had more than I needed, probably. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, that was uh, that Houston game. I, it was a punt return, and I, the center was coming down unblocked. And I just, I, I, and some of it's just stupid. All I had to do is get in his way. But I decided, well, I'm gonna try and knock his head off. And you know, he's 250, and I'm 170. It was just, it was probably not one of the wisest decisions I made. But uh, anyway, I did, and I was gone. Uh, I, Johnny Johnson made a fabulous return, like 40 yard return, and I'm wandering around looking like I have no idea where I'm at during the whole play. Uh, that was, that was kind of humorous. I will, I will give that part to it, but, but the, the concussion piece is, you know, back then, uh, and especially in the NFL, there was such a, uh, it was like, you know, get your eyes cleared and get back in. And, uh, you would be, you'd be concussed and, and, uh, they'd stick you back in the football game. And then, you know, obviously the game's changed now significantly and good for them. Good that they're doing that. But, uh, it's been painful to watch people that I play with specifically in the NFL, uh, that have gone through that and, and have ended, you know, their lives have ended tragically in, in some cases. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's tough. I don't have, uh, yeah, although some of my family would argue that I've got symptoms of any all sorts of bad stuff, but <laughs> they're they're that's tongue in cheek. But right now, I don't really have any um, major issues going on. And I I think, and I talked, I actually did a baseline test with the NFL uh, to kind of baseline my cognitive thinking, and and uh, I talked to the guy, uh, and he said, you know, and I said. There's got to be, because I was looking at all these guys, that there were some guys that were suffering CTE that, I mean, they wouldn't hit anybody. And then there were guys who were didn't have CTE, and they were as tough as nails out on the football field. And, and I, uh, I said, there's got to be a genetic tie. The way you're, you know, physiologically and the way your brain works and everything, the way your body reacts to it, there's got to be some time, he said, you know, and he, he, he agreed with me. I don't know, but, but, uh, I, I just think there is something like that. It, and it's, it's, uh, it's just a sad part of the game. And, and I don't think you're going to have near as much going forward because of the protocols they have now, mm-hmm. but it was, uh, they didn't have protocol back then. I mean, it was suck it up and get back out there. once your eyes clear. Right. Right. Well, Glenn, uh, on a lighter subject, <laughs> uh, <laughs> as far as uh, getting into the NFL, um, mm-hmm. you know, you, you kind of got into uh, UT thinking, I don't know, that, that you know, you were in o- above your pay grade. Uh, so at what point did you see your college career and go, hey, I could I could make it at the pro level, too? Well, it's fun. There's another fun. I mean, I, I, all these things are, there's a common theme in my part progression as a football player that, uh, uh, the, the, uh, I asked Alan Lowry, uh, at one point, this was actually after the Cotton Bowl where we lost to Notre Dame and we were just sitting there talking and I said, do you think I got a shot playing the NFL? And Alan, Alan's such a nice guy. 
He, he is just he and he and he's such an honest guy that he can't lie. You know, he can't. <laughs> and he looked at me and he went, "Well, I, I, you know, I mean, he was just hedging all over the place." <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I looked at it like this. You know, I had give I, and and I wish more college players would look at it like like this and and it's not because i was some smart wise guy i just looked at it. i was a little runt and i thought the chances of me making the nfl are slim and so i better i better get through this four years at texas with a curriculum of study behind me so that i can prepare myself for life after football and uh and so that's the way i thought i i didn't really i, I didn't think i was going to get drafted uh, I hoped I might. I thought, I thought what I really thought was I might have a shot to go, you know, free agent to like Houston or somewhere and just give it a shot. And uh, and literally, uh, uh, there was a guy named Steve Crosby who lives up in uh, actually lives up uh, in uh, near near Austin now. Uh, he was our scout with the Dolphins at the time, and he he came to watch some other players at Texas. And he saw me in a scrimmage, and he saw the way I he, – he had one play in mind where he saw that I was covering one guy, but I kept my vision open, and I came off on a guy running the seam and picked, picked off the pass. And he went to Bill Arsbarger, and he said, this is the kind of guy you want in your your defense because he knows how to think on the field. And uh, so I – the second day of the draft – uh, you remember Irk Slavin was the same year as me. He got drafted number one by mm-hmm. the Saints. He threw a party for himself, and everybody was up for a party back then. And so <laughs> we went. I stayed out too late, and I I went back then. You had the phone on the cradles, and I went and got in the bed, knocked the phone off the hook, and uh, I I got uh, I got a banging on the door of my apartment because we uh, we were as a senior, we could move off campus. I banged on the door, and I said, you know, I started yelling, "Who is it? What do you want?" and uh, the, it was our yard guy for the apartment complex. And he says, uh, are you Glenn Blackwood? And I said, yeah. And he said, y- your phone's off the hook. And I said, well, so? And he said, well, and this is how I learned about being drafted. He said, well, I think you've been drafted by the Miami Dolphins. You need to put your phone on the hook so they can call you. And <laughs> they, had, they had tried to call me and kept getting a busy signal. And so uh, uh, anyway, I called them up and they said they drafted me and, I came down here and and uh you know I did the same thing I did at Texas. I learned the corner, I learned the safe both safety positions because I just I was I was about wanting to study the way the whole defense was put together and I would answer questions. Uh, they had stuck me at corner initially and I'd answer questions for the safeties when we were in rookie room uh where they were just working with the rookies and Bill Arsparger started shaking his head and he's kind of like he he said this guy you know gets it from a schematic standpoint and so uh i think that helped me and then i i had a really good preseason i played pretty well broke my broke my thumb the first game and as a corner that's not a great thing but i ended up wading through it and and by the time we started and played buffalo the first game i was uh, i was our nickel back and uh uh and then started my second year and I just was really fortunate. You know, I blew my knee out my rookie year. Uh, my brother was blocking on me uh, against the Colts, and uh, and I planted to go around him, and my knee popped, and and I uh, tore my ACL. And that was back then. That was a fifty-fifty year, never going to play again. And uh, ended up playing nine more years. I was fortunate. Glenn, uh, you were part of the great uh, teams of the eighties. You know, obviously everybody remembers Dan Marino leading the Miami offense, but your defensive unit and the, the famed Killer Bees, you know, you and uh, your brother Lyle, and then I just remember off the top Bob Baumhauer and Kim Bo Camper and and uh, whatever. I mean, how exciting was that to play in a town like Miami when the Miami Vice stuff was coming out later and. Uh, you know, you had Marino, and you had that unit on defense, and Don Shula was a kind of a rock star. What What are the key memories? <laughs> well, you know, 
82 was just, I mean, we were the number one defense in the NFL. We had the number one secondary. We really had a good football team. Uh, we didn't have Marino in 82. Uh, we had David Woodley, and that's when we went to the Super Bowl, played the Redskins, and and Don uh, John Riggins broke our back on the fourth and one play with, you know, 10 minutes left in the game. And it just was uh, – uh, that was tough because our offense really was having a tough time putting anything together. And, but that was such a fun year. It was a strike year, so it was kind of shortened and abbreviated, but – it was uh, it was so much fun, and we were we were doing a lot of the stuff that you see the guys do today. Bill Arnsbarger invented the zone blitz. Uh, you know, a lot of people uh, uh, talk about. Uh, oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. The guy in Pittsburgh uh, that uh, did so much zone blitzing, but even he in his book t- references Bill Arnsbarger's, and we we. We took our two linebackers and would send both of them out of a 3-5. So now we have a five-man rush, but we drop Kim Bocamp, our defensive end, back out in the coverage. And so it's like Arnsberger said, we're getting a five-man rush with just with, with uh, maximum uh, uh, coverage. And it was just we would we were eating people up with that stuff, and uh, it was it was just a blast. And uh, I, you know, we really studied our teams. We, I, at that point we were four years in, I was four years in the NFL. And so I, I mean, you, you could figure out, you know, I mean, there were just some great coaches, but I loved trying to figure Joe Walton out, the offensive coordinator for the Jets and the stuff he'd come up with. And we, we played in the, the, the AFC championship game against them down here. And, and, uh, and they ran this little play, which was a great play. They di- ran a dive to the fullback, but he pulled. Uh, Todd would pull the back out and then throw a little flip pass, like a like that wide screen you see a lot in college football today to a guy named Bruce Harper. And uh, mm-hmm. AJ Dewey picked it off because we had worked on that play so much, and AJ just made a fantastic play, athletic play, and and uh, and mental play, and 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 scored, and we go we beat them fourteen zip and. Uh, great, great memories. I mean, I, that, that time, you know, it was just, I don't know, it was just fun. I mean, you could, you could just laugh on the football field and have a great time because you just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard to explain. You, you, it's just when you're gelling together and everything's working mm-hmm. well. And then, you know, what's weird is that all of a sudden one guy gets hurt or two guys get hurt and that whole dynamic changes. And, uh, and that's exactly what happened to us in 84. We, we, you know, AJ got hurt and, uh, Duet got hurt and, and we, uh, you know, we kind of went down defensively and played the 49ers in the Super Bowl and got our butts handed to us. And, uh, and they had a super football team, but man, we, uh, we, we, we weren't, we weren't the team we were, you know, two years before. Glenn, on a different note, uh, I wanted to just ask you, it seems like, Nobody, at least in college these days, knows how to tackle. <laughs> so I wanted to get your uh, thoughts on that, <laughs> and especially defensive backs. And then, if you could, uh, maybe uh, pontificate or read the tea leaves. How can the Longhorns be so mediocre with so much talent for the past uh, 12, 13 years? Well, the second question, I'm going to – I may – I'll fudge a little on that one, but I'll talk with you about it. But the first question is the tackling. Uh, mm-hmm. The tackling issue is a big issue, it, it, and it, you know, I, I I'm a firm believer, and you can't. This is this part of the problem with this targeting, and with everything, all this other stuff. They're taking the game of football out of the game of football. There, there's, yeah. there's you you can't as a you cannot as a defensive player tackle well if you can't put your nose in the numbers. If you can, and, and, and that's not putting the top of your helmet. That's putting your nose. So nobody's mm-hmm. going to get hurt bad. Look, fo- people are going to get hurt. You know, uh, if you run and you hit a guy hard, he's, it, it hurts. There's, there's value in that for me as a defensive player. I want to send a message. Uh, but if you do it with your nose, with the nose in the numbers, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to knock them out. You're not going to take their knees out, any of that stuff. And, and, uh, and, and ruin their career. And, uh, they, you can't teach that now because if you lead with your helmet, even the face guard of your helmet, I'm, I watched the middle linebacker for Clemson get kicked out of the national championship game 
for the finest tackle I've seen. He had a guy ran a slant, and he nosed in the numbers, hit him head up. What's he supposed to do? He's got hmm. to be able to, to, to play defense. And they have, our, my opinion is that they have got to do something with this targeting thing because it's out of control. And you've got, you've got, you've got refs that are way too, uh, you know, they're, they're not looking at it and saying this is the game of football. They're looking at, there are times where guys are spearing, they're going after the guy, where you got a quarterback and the guy lowers his head and hits him in the back. I get all that. I, I'm, I'm all in on that. And I'm all in on not, you know, but but I, I tell you what, I bet you I can't m- mention the amount of times I watched a running back lower his head and run over a defensive back or a linebacker, and they don't call they don't call a targeting on that. That that's crazy. This it, it's I, I as you can see, I'm a little emotional about that whole <laughs> thing, but uh, I just I just think it's nuts, and 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 so. You, you know, being able to get your coaches to be able to teach proper tackling, which is if you look at their numbers and you put your nose in those numbers, you're going to tackle them you're, or at mm-hmm. least have a good shot at it. But the way it is now, you've got to go off to the side. You have to turn your head. You have to do all this stuff. It, it's it's I, I don't know. I, I understand the crown of the helmet. I just don't understand the nose and the numbers uh, deal. And, and, I think they've got to they've got to get a handle on that because otherwise uh, you, it's just going to be a fiasco from a tackling perspective. And then I think you know I don't I don't th- that's the only grace I give the coaches and the, the players today is that it's such a it's a you you can't really you can't be aggressive you know and go out and and tag people. Uh, you've got to think okay is this going to get me kicked out and it and it's not just it's not just a 15-yard penalty. You're kicked out of the daggum game and half of the next game. And so it's just uh, I, have a, I have a visceral reaction to that because I've played the game so long that what they're doing is they're putting these kids in untenable situations, in my opinion. So that's that. Uh, University of Texas, uh, how are they so mediocre when they have all these players? I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, you know, I don't know the players well enough. I, I tell you what I, here's what I do know. Uh, and I, I, I'm seeing it a little bit with the, with the staff that's in there now. Uh, there's a little bit of act like you've been there, uh, coming there. And, and that wasn't the way it was for many years before that, where, uh, you have guys, you know, jumping up because they made a hit on a, on a receiver or they knocked a pass down. That's what you're supposed to do. That is what your job is. So don't act like – and, by the way, just because you made that play, that may have been because your defensive lineman put pressure on them. Just act like you've been there before. The great players that ever play this game, if you look at them, what did Walter Payton do after he scored a touchdown? What did Barry Sanders do after he scored a touchdown? What did Earl Campbell do after he scored a touchdown? What – what all these guys, they tossed the ball to the ref and went back to the sideline and thanked their offensive lineman for blocking for them. You know, this is what, we, this is to me, we've got to get people with, with character and with disposition that say, this is my job. And if I don't do it, I'm going to be ashamed of myself. But if I do do it, that's what I'm supposed to do. And I'm going to celebrate with my teammates in real celebration as opposed to, drawing all this attention to myself. Uh, that drives me crazy. No, I'm with you there. I think you just spoke for uh, <laughs> about 50 million at least football fans, Glenn. So <laughs> it's good to hear that. It is a team, and there are 11 guys mm-hmm. out there. And I had plays where I made really good breaks on the ball, and I, I made a good interception. But I can guarantee you if that quarterback had a lot more time, they probably may not have thrown that ball. It's all ties together. And there's times mm-hmm. where I cover the guy and my defensive lineman gets a sack because the quarterback had a had a double double pump. And so it all works together, but you're you're doing this as a team. It's not an individual game. And if you I I love the kid that Texas had as running back last both the running backs, Roshan and uh Bijan. Yeah. Uh 
they were humble in the way they handled themselves on the football field. Texas needs that in spades. Right on, right on. So uh, tell me now, what has Glenn Blackwood been doing since football? <laughs> well, anything I could, because we didn't make money back then. <laughs> uh, my my rookie year, I made $28,000 and a $5,000 bonus. So I was uh, – it, it's things have changed a lot. And, and, look, we fought for that stuff. We fought for free agency, and I'm glad these guys are making all the – cash they're making and good for them uh but we you know you don't come out of the nfl back when i played and and you know have a big pot to rest on so i had to go to work and uh yeah. bought a little company and sold it and then started another business in florida that works for banks and financial institutions uh built that up sold it uh started it back up again it was kind of a weird deal i actually got my whole company back uh, for nothing and then did it because a lot of the stuff we do is relationship driven and and uh, and I had the relationships and so got the company back did it again and sold it another time and and uh, and so I'm on the back end of, uh, of a, it was mainly a consulting business with uh, uh, doing executive and director benefit plans and so kind of a real boring, nerdy stuff, you know, uh, regulatory, accounting, legal, all that junk. And, and, uh, but I, you know, it was kind of like looking at football. I, I like putting all the pieces together and it, 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 it worked pretty well for me. And so, uh, I'm, I'm at a point in my life where I'm trying to back out of that to a certain extent. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think I'll ever quit, but I'm uh, trying to ease out of it. I got a young man that I'm training and, and he's very good, and so that's that's kind of where I'm at. I've got four kids. Uh, Beth, my wife, and I have been married. I don't um, uh, forty years now, and uh, uh, I've got uh, four kids. Uh, one that's uh, down here by us has three. I've got eight eight grandchildren and one on the way. So uh, coached my son in football, which was really good, cool in high school, and then he went to. Georgia Tech on a scholarship and and then uh, went on to graduate school from there and got his doctorate in economics. So uh, and I've got two daughters, one in California and one in Kentucky. So they're all over. They're in, they're millennials. My kids are true millennials. They're all over the place. Nice. Glenn, it's just been great to hear it from you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and I'll let Chris close it out. But man, it's great to hear from you. And I'm gonna get. Uh, Get that highlight uh, reel of uh, you sticking Bubba B. Those are great memories, but you know, I I just at the end of the day, I I I you know, I hope my contribution in life has not been just to be a good football player or a decent football player. I don't even know that I was good. I think I was just decent. Uh, but uh, you know, I just they, as y'all know, there's more to life than than that game and. Uh, and I, I appreciate the opportunity. Matter of fact, I'm just going to, the, the, the fact that this is on TSL land, just the things that they're doing and allowing those, uh, people that have done okay in life to help out, uh, people that were part of the University of Texas sports program. And for me, the coolest thing is the, you know, that they're helping out people that are, it, it isn't about football. It's about, volleyball or, or basketball or tennis or whatever, but it's just people in need. And, uh, and that's what we're asked to do in life. You know, we're really asked to, if you, if you got that opportunity and you can help somebody, um, and it makes a difference in their life, do it. And I'm just really thankful for, for what uh, TSL is doing that. They didn't ask me to say that. I'm just saying it. Well, I'll just say, I know that, uh, CEO Billy Dale and, uh, all the board of directors uh, just really appreciate uh, the guys like yourself, Glenn, who, uh, who continue to give back. It's just a privilege. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's really not something that's, oh, what a great guy. It's just a privilege that we have to be able to do that. So that's just the way I look at it. Hey, man, Glenn Blackwood, thank you so much for uh, sitting down with us, sharing a little bit of your story. It's my pleasure. You guys have a great day, and hook them horns. Hopefully we'll have a 
year and next year that uh, challenges those bulldogs. You know, my wife's a Georgia bulldog, so I'm, oh. I'm I'm having to eat I'm having to eat it this year and last year. So well, we need to have a little bit of success here, so so I can start uh, you know uh, standing up a little taller. <laughs> I love it. thank my guest Glenn Blackwood for sitting down with Larry and I and talking about his amazing career. A wonderful career, wonderful accomplishments, and an even better person. Once again, I have to thank Beth Koblenz Realtor at 281-772-8936 for bringing you this episode. Remember, if you would like to help in the collection of these amazing oral histories, you can reach out to Billy Dale at billydale1 at gmail.com. That's B-I-L-L-Y-D-A-L-E-1, the number one, at gmail.com. And he can get you set up with everything you need to help us continue to tell these amazing stories from UT Athletics. For the Texas Legacy Support Network Show, I'm Chris Daly, reminding you to keep reaching for the stars and don't stop till you get there.